parents report noticeable changes in the outlook of their kids, their mood, their disposition. They're more stable, less likely to have a breakdown or a tantrum. And even noticing the taste of, of foods more noticeably after eliminating sugar. And again, this is because if you're on a high sugar diet, your sweet taste receptors are constantly being activated, overwhelming all the other tastes that might be in the food. So if you if you take that out of the equation, you can awaken some of the other taste receptors. Hey, it's Monday, and guess what? It is another episode of the Thrive State Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. V. Super, again, excited that you are joining us for this podcast. And again, look, if you've gotten a lot of value from the podcast, if you're liking what we're putting out there, please support it by liking, by subscribing, and by rating us at ratethispodcast.com slash Thrive State. Now, today I'm really super excited about our guest today because he has a very special message out there. His name is Dr. Michael Gorin. He is a professor of medicine over at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. And he's going to talk about the epidemic of sugar causing increases in child obesity rates, as well as other chronic disease. It's a very dear topic to my heart because as all of you may know, I've lost two grandmothers to to diabetes. I myself five years ago was diabetic. And it wasn't, you know, because, you know, all of a sudden, you know, we became adults and, and we picked up diabetes. A lot of chronic disease are, are conditions that are picked up over time from the way we live our life. One of those things and one of the large contributing factors of chronic disease, because it puts us in that stress state is sugar. That was very prominent in my life. And when I cut it out, when I, when I started to cut out things that elevated my blood sugars, I reversed my chronic diseases and really in that thrive state now. And so the message of this book is so important. We, we go in today as to the epidemic of childhood obesity, the, the rise in chronic disease, where sugar plays in the role, what it does in our body and our sugar alternative, healthy or not, you're, you're going to find out that as well as how to actually reduce some of the sugar intake that's going on in the life of your child and your own life. So this is a super, super uh, important episode. And I just wanted to, to introduce Dr. Gorin because again, he is a professor of medicine at the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Dr. Gorin is also the program director for diabetes and obesity at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles, as well as the Sabin Research Institute, Professor of Pediatrics and the Atkins Endowed Chair in Pediatric Obesity and Diabetes Keck School of Medicine, USC. He's a great fun to, uh, to talk with, and you'll soon find out that he's actually, I won't even say where he's from, but see if you can tell from his accent. Ladies and gentlemen, please enjoy this conversation with me and Dr. Michael Gorin. Dr. Michael Gorin, welcome to the Thrive State Podcast. Thank you for your time. Pleasure to be here. Really is. Look forward to talking with you today. Super looking forward to this conversation. Why is it, why am I looking forward to it? Well, number one, I just, I'm a new dad and I have a, you know, five month year old. Thank you so much. I've got a five month year old baby. And, you know, you know, frankly, I'm a little bit concerned with, you know, how kids are marketed to and the foods that, you know, that, that people are eating. Another reason why I am so happy to have you on was, you know, five years ago, I was overweight, I was diabetic, I was hypertensive. And I thought I was going to go on chronic medications all the time. And mm -hmm. it was it would, you know, and, and, and you know, diabetes is such an important thing, because I lost both my grandmothers to end stage complications of diabetes. And, you know, I was able to reverse my conditions in four to six months and, and a message as, such as this, uh, a message to know, you know, an adult doesn't necessarily just become an adult and then all of a sudden, you know, develop, you know, diabetes, you know, it, there are things, there are lifestyles and their choices that people pick up when they're very, very young that eventually lead to the habits that lead to chronic disease, which, you know, therefore I'm super excited about diving into. 
Now, before we begin, as my audience likes to, and they, they know, I ask a series of five fast questions just to get to know you a little bit better. Okay. So they're all worth a thousand points and the points really mean nothing. But okay. uh, as a host, I'm ready. I, here we go. <laughs> Question number one. What is your number one favorite activity to do outside of research? Tennis. Tennis. Yes. I, I, you, well, that's all you need or you want no, to No, no, no. Go on. Yeah. What, what no, about I, tennis? I, st- I played a lot as a kid and then I stopped when I went to college and I started to play again 10 years ago and I love it. Um, I just love the feeling. It's such a great stress release. It's a great mental exercise. It's great physical I just love it. That's excellent. And, you know, one of the things I talk about in my book when when we talk about, you know, you know, tapping into more positive emotional states is remembering the things that used to bring us joy and then doing them again. So great answer. Number two, outside of tennis, what do you do to relax? Uh, Tennis. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I like cooking. I like being, I think I like being in the kitchen. I like hanging out with my family. I used to like traveling a lot. We're starting to do a bit more of that now. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. Cooking and spending time with family. I, I don't do the first, but, but I do enjoy doing spending time with family. Number three, what do you want people to know about you, but that they might not already know? I've, you know, I think a lot of people just assume, well, they make assumptions yeah. about, you know, about people. I've been doing this research for almost 40 years. Uh, I have my PhD. I've been, you know, systematically studying uh, childhood nutrition and its impact on short and long-term health for 35 years. So this is, this has been my passion, my career long passion. Uh, Another thing that just for fun, I'm Scottish. People don't always recognize that. But I like to talk about that because a lot of people like Scotland too. And you can't tell from looking at me or listening to me because I lost my accent, but I still am deeply, passionately Scottish. Oh, wow. You know, I just started to pick it up now. And I oh, think yeah, it'll, once it'll you, come once back. You, once you said it, you know, I, I think you you lean into it a little bit. Oh, more. yeah. So, so great. Absolutely. Scottish. Scottish. Number four. What was the most challenging time in your life? That's a that's a really good Scottish accent. Oh, thank you. Yes, you have you have a hidden ancestors. <laughs> uh, I think the the most challenging part of this job or of my life. Yeah. I think it's uh you know it's funding the research. Yeah. Okay. And we, we and and it, it comes in it waxes and wanes. I've had periods of great success and I've had periods of lulls in funding. And, I you know, see. I've gone. I've gone five to 10 years almost without being successful in getting funding for my research. Oh, and, I see. Um, but despite that, I've maintained continuous funding from, in a, from the federal government for this work for over 35 years, but that hasn't come easy. Yeah. Uh, and I, there was a long period of time where it was very difficult. It's just very competitive. It's just very, very challenging to keep that funding alive. Well, I'm really glad you're getting out there and you're getting into the media. And as people get to know you, get to know your mission, you know, m- potentially even attracting some private donors uh, could, could be something that that is uh, in the, in your new, near future as well. Yeah. And that's the new challenge. You know, I, the, the, the new challenge, we've written the book. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Now the challenge is getting the word out. And of course, the, that's even more difficult now with the pandemic and the whole change in the way the media is working. Yeah. But, Getting the word out about this topic to people who really need to know and would have the greatest potential of benefit, I wish I could reach more and more people who really well, need this information. I know the people in the Thrive State podcast are really going to enjoy this conversation and your message. And last question here, what has been your proudest moment? Oof. I have to say my kids, you know, mm, you, yeah. you're, you're, you're a new dad. Yeah, uh, my kids are uh, 15 and almost 19. One's about to go off to college, so I'm really proud of them. The last two year or two has been super challenging, and they've just pulled through and become so much stronger and so much more resilient. And we've become closer as a family. I think it's one of the 
nice side effects, but I'm really proud of of my kids and what they've done and what they're going to do. Wonderful. I, I had a very similar experience of how how the pandemic has has allowed me to get closer to my fiance and and you know build closer to relationships with my family and and also you know challenges that we've gone through together made really made us stronger. So I absolutely, I, absolutely, yeah. I resonate with that. Now, a little bit, you know, before we dive into the book and your work, I want to find out who was the who was the child from Scotland. Uh, how you know one were you born in scotland how did you you know have you always been you know uh fascinated by your research topic how is a kid growing up i want to know your background and your origin story uh and then and then how you you know became a researcher yeah I, so I, yes i grew up in glasgow um in scotland i went went to school there my my mother still lives there my dad passed away a few years ago and that's where I went to school. I had an initial ambition of going to medical school and being a doctor. That's in the UK. That's super duper competitive, and I, you know, I didn't quite make the cut for that. But I also enjoyed. I loved biology and I loved chemistry, and I put those together. I studied biochemistry at college, and I just loved being in school. I loved learning, so I stayed on did my PhD. Didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I loved just learning and I loved being in university and I loved the process. And then when I, after I got my doctorate, I came to the US in 1987 because finding a job at that time was very difficult in the UK. And I knew I wanted to do more research. I became, through my research initially and through my graduate work, my, my PhD, by the way, was studying rats. So I, was an, I did an animal model of infection. I, what I learned from that was I didn't want to study rats anymore. Mm. But on the positive side, what I became very passionate about was understanding the whole body response to stress and different yes. types of reactions. So the model system for the PhD was infection. But what I became very curious about was how the whole body integrates its response. And then in my postdoctoral work after PhD, it was all about nutrition. It's how the body adapts to different states of nutrition. And then more particularly for me, I became very interested in childhood and because it's a very it's a dynamic state of growth and adjustment. So I was always very curious about how do we regulate that growth? How does the body know when to grow, when to stop growing? What happens when it grows too much? What happens when there's overnutrition or undernutrition during that rapid period of growth? So that's what I dug into during my postdoctoral studies. And just basically for 30, 35 years, followed the data from my studies and got to this point today in this journey, which, you know, when I started 30 years ago, we weren't talking about obesity in childhood or overnutrition. It was very, Mm -hmm. very little known about that. And through my journey, I've, you know, I've seen drastic shifts in that perspective where obesity in childhood did become an issue in 2000. Type 2 diabetes was emerging in childhood, used to be called adult onset diabetes. Uh, We did some of the first studies in childhood looking at risk factors for early onset diabetes. And then more recently, fatty liver disease. So it's just been a really interesting journey to see those shifts in how obesity has become an issue in childhood and how it's not just obesity, but it's the secondary effects and metabolic diseases that have become an issue. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something that I, I talk about in my podcast as well as my my platform overall is this rise in chronic disease, not just diabetes, but hypertension, autoimmune disorders, all these chronic conditions seem to be stemming, you know, up. And the question is, are there new toxins? Are there new infections? in the world, has our DNA mutated? And uh, largely that's not the case. I mean, you know, 
we did go through a pandemic and certainly, you know, on, on occasion there, there is an introduction of, of such mm-hmm. things uh, into our system, but by and large, it's our culture and how we live our life that has probably changed in the last couple of decades that has really, you know, contributed to the, the chronic disease epidemic we have right now, probably a one in every two Americans are pre-diabetic or diabetic. One in two Americans have some form of chronic disease and one in four have multiple chronic conditions. They've become a national and global epidemic. And again, they don't suddenly start an adult and they're starting to creep in earlier, earlier on. So can you yeah. kind of talk about what you're seeing and probably what your thoughts are and what's, what are some of these things that are contributing to, to these alarming numbers? Yeah, and that's exactly, you know, what the research is focused on is this this kind of long-term chronic uh, diseases. And we, you know, we've looked at uh, many of the factors that you've just talked about, and some do play a role. So we're seeing things like, you know, air pollution exposure, for example, unexpected contributing factor to increasing rates of childhood obesity. It's not the only factor, Mm -hmm. but these things all contribute. I've become very interested in nutrition because the whole nutritional landscape for children has changed dramatically from when I was a kid growing up in Scotland. And in particular, and we didn't, we didn't just choose sugar to pick on sugar, but it, that emerged from our research that sugar kept popping up as a modifiable factor related not just to excess body weight in childhood, but risk for diabetes, risk for fatty liver, and some of the other things that you mentioned, cardiovascular risk and so on. So it was sugar that kept popping up and we're consuming more sugar than ever. Kids today are consuming more sugar and different types of sugar yeah, um, and different types of sweeteners. So the whole landscape of more processed foods, more additives, more sweeteners, this is having a massive impact on childhood and a major motivation for writing the book was the realization of how this specifically affects childhood. I'm not saying adults are immune from this problem, but there are effects on childhood that are specific to childhood. And we can talk about that. And that's because children are still growing. So Mm. the whole process of growing a brain or growing a liver to become healthy can be derailed by uh, excess sugar. Let's talk about this excess sugar problem. How did it start to become so prevalent and why are more children consuming uh, more sugar now than ever, ever before? Yeah, it's, it's more sugar, more, more types of sugar and in different forms. So for example, kids and adults are consuming more liquid sugar. Water and milk used to be the main beverages of choice. Growing up, of course, I had soda and sweet drinks once in a while but not every day. So I think there's been a shift in beverage consumption away from water and milk towards a whole, you know, hand, you know, a whole army of different types of liquid beverages, energy drinks, soda, frappuccinos, sodas, and juice as well. And then there's the shift in types of sugar. So it used to be that pre-1970 globally, the main source of added sugar in a diet was sucrose from either uh, sugar cane or beets. But now we have high fructose corn syrup and over 200 different names and types of sugars that can be added during food processing. Sli- you know, they're all somewhat similar, but some have more fructose. So we can talk about that too and the kind of tilting, shifting. Uh, towards more predominance of fructose in sweeteners and fructose in particular is more damaging of a sweetener. So those are the main things that there's not just more sugar, but different types of sugar and in different forms, liquid sugar in particular being problematic, especially when it becomes, especially when it involves fructose. That's a really good point. And the thing is so many food manufacturers are using the fact that they could hide the sugar in some of the the products by 
by naming them all these different things that aren't just sugar. You, you mentioned yeah. a few of them, fructose, sucrose, galactose, you know, high fructose corn syrup, you know, it, it's hidden in so many different phrases that unless you're really educated about it, you don't know how much sugar is lurking in the foods that you're eating. And they're, you know, they're designed to be healthy sounding. So for example, organic brown rice syrup. Yeah. Sounds pretty good. Evaporated grape juice. In essence, these are just sugars, uh, some of which uh, can be higher in fructose, some of them are higher in glucose, but they're, you know, evapor organic brown rice syrup is just corn syrup. It's the same thing. At the end of the day, it's just derived from organic brown rice rather than corn. That's right. So not only are, are the sugars hidden, but, you know, a lot of these food companies actually hired food scientists to make it very, very tasty and addictive for, for, for people to eat food. Can you talk about how, you know, evolutionary, we probably do have a sweet tooth, but they're not, it's not meant to, you know, for, for us to eat sweets, you know, 24 hours out of the day. Yeah, it's, it's, this is this is an interesting point and another v critical pivotal moment in my understanding that led to the book was the realization that babies are actually born with a built-in sweet tooth. They're born with an innate um, craving for sweetness, which is supposed to be protective from an evolutionary perspective because it favors liking of breast milk, which is sweet, and favors avoiding uh, foods that might have spoiled or gone bad or toxic berries from the forest floor. But in today's food environment, where over 70% of processed foods have added sugar, over 80% of foods targeted to children have added sugar, this innate preference for sweetness is backfiring. Food companies are essentially hijacking that built-in preference by designing products that they know infants and children will like because they have this built-in sweet taste preference and then they get hooked on them. Yeah, that's that's very, very unfortunate. I mean, what do you know now that more of the research is coming out, books such as Sugar Proof is coming out, are we doing anything as a nation or, you know, at, at the government level to, you know, bring more awareness as to the, the practices of these food companies that are really, you know, tarnishing the, the thoughts and behaviors of children, you know, seeking the, the, these things that are really detrimental for the health of, on the short term and the long term. I think the most recent thing that happened that was fairly positive and a nice development, the new dietary guidelines for America that were released in January of this year, for the first time recommended zero added sugars for babies aged zero to two years of age. That's a recommendation we make in Sugar Proof as well. And the USDA uh, endorsed that agreement. So they also are limiting or recommending limiting added sugars to 10% or less of calories. So that, you know, that's very top level. Is it really having an impact on <clears throat> what people are consuming? Is it having an impact on food companies and, and formulations for different foods? I, I don't know if we're seeing that yet. I hope it will. It should because like I just said, 80% of food products developed specifically for infants and children have some type of added sugar. Yeah. And now the dietary guidelines say zero added sugars for that age group. So Hopefully it's gonna force them to reconsider other healthier options, what I hope won't happen. But unfortunately, this is what we're seeing in for adults and in other parts of the world. Food companies are being forced to reduce sugar and they're just replacing them with sweeteners, mm. non-caloric sweeteners, which by themselves may have uh, their own problems. This episode of the Thrive State Podcast is brought to you by the Thrive State Accelerator. The Thrive State Accelerator is actually a home course that I developed using the exact same techniques I work with my celebrity clients, CEOs, and executives on how to get them to the Thrive State. The Thrive State Accelerator teaches you how to master your seven bioenergetic elements. That's sleep, nutrition, movement, stress and emotional mastery, relationships, our thoughts and mindset, as well as purpose. 
In this Thrive State Accelerator, you're also gonna get a bonus module on optimization. That's how I talk about supplementation, peptides, all the optimization techniques I use with my clients to get them to the Thrive State. Now, for some of you who are just joining us for the first time, you guys might be wondering, what is the Thrive State? Well, the Thrive State is actually the energy the epigenetic environment we give to ourselves, telling ourselves, telling our DNA how to act and how to respond. And if we want optimal health, longevity, and peak performance, if we can master these seven bioenergetic elements, our ability to have those three things that we just said, optimal health, longevity, and peak performance is at its greatest. And it also prevents you from getting chronic symptoms like brain fog, being overweight, feeling sluggish, acne, pain, all these chronic symptoms, as well as preventing you from getting chronic disease. So getting to that thrive state is really getting to that state to master being that very best version of yourself so you could show up for you, for your family, for your business, everything that's important to you. So go ahead, check it out right now at kianbu.com slash accelerator and use coupon code podcast 25 for 25% off. Now back to the podcast. Yeah, I'd love to get into that in, in in a second, but you know, I know sugar is a big you know uh, issue. Uh, I wonder what your thoughts are in childhood in regards to uh, grains or maybe other foods that have a higher glycemic index or a higher glycemic load. Do you think that's generally okay? I know that once I had diabetes, I had to restrict you know those foods you know myself in addition to sugar. But what are your thoughts on on that for children? I think the same issues certainly are relevant. We're not, for children, we're not saying no sugar whatsoever. We can talk about that. You know, we're talking about reducing sugar, finding a more healthy level, but certainly it's not just about sugar because simple carbohydrates turn rapidly into Mm -hmm. sugar in the blood. And I think for children, it's the same as adults. It's all about regulation of blood sugar levels. Mm. And some of, some of the, Issues that are uh, of importance related to sugar are all about blood sugar control. So maintaining steady blood sugar levels are just as vitally important for kids as it is for adults. And you you, you can do that by upping fiber, pairing carbohydrates with protein, eating uh, less processed carbohydrates and so on, just like we would do as adults. That's beautiful. I want to get into more of those strategies in a second, but you, you, you mentioned sugar alternatives. You know, many people seem to think that they are better because they're, they're not actually sugar. Oh, there's no calories, but let's talk about maybe some of the dangers of these, you know, sugar additives, you know, and, and why, why that might be the case. And, and, you know, let's list some, and do you feel like there is any sugar alternatives that, actually is is a plus or or that you know people could could feel like they're using safely but uh why don't you expand on some of that yeah there, there's i think 20 to 25 fda approved sweeteners sucralose aspartame ASK are the most common ones stevia monk fruit it's hard to to really generalize because they all act very differently sure. um, on the body and have different effects. So it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of a group of different types of compounds. Ultimately though, it's, it's the, the analogy I use is like, it's like a fool's gold. Yeah. It's sweetness without the calories sounds great, but it's really a bit of a trap and, and it tr- basically tricks the body into thinking that it was receiving sugar when it's not. So there's, there's multiple issues. Yeah. So one is that if you're faced with the opportunity to eat something without sugar or sugar free, you might eat more of it because you kind of feel like you've gotten a little bit of a free pass. Oh, it's sugar free. I'll just have another one or I'll have an extra bowl of ice cream or whatever. Uh, and studies actually back that up. So studies show that If you're habitually consuming non-caloric sweeteners, you end up consuming more calories throughout the day and more sugar. At the end of the day, it does not resolve the craving for sweetness. In fact, it might even promote craving for more sweetness. 
Yeah, so that's an issue. What I've heard is, um, could it lead to, you know, tricking your body into releasing more insulin, causing hypoglycemia, which makes you hungrier, and then you're eating more calories at the end of the day? That's exactly the case. And you know, I, I see a lot of people say, oh, there's no glucose spike, so that makes it okay. Well, it's not just about the glucose spike. It may, call, it may cause a glucose dip because of a rapid insulin response. The rapid insulin response occurs just exactly as you said. If the body thinks there's glucose coming in, and it will if you consume a sweetener because these sweeteners activate very powerfully the receptors for glucose, the body thinks there's glucose coming in, so it will release insulin. What will insulin do? Insulin will clear glucose from the circulation because it thinks there was a surplus coming in, but there wasn't. So you become hypoglycemic and irritated and hungry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another issue with a lot of these sugar substitutes are they could potentially wreck your, your gut microbiome. Some of, the, some of these uh, sugar additives are not well absorbed. And so they add to the osmotic uh, gradient in your bowel. And some, some people can get some diarrhea uh, with these sugar substitutes. Do you find any of them to be healthy or a healthier alternative uh, to sugar itself? I Such don't. As, like, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, the, the monk fruit and the stevia are probably our best alternative. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, we get we have a lot of um, of our followers who will res respond similarly and say, oh, monk, monk fruit is okay, it's natural, stevia is natural. But, you know, the reality is the sweeteners are purified products from the stevia leaf or from the monk fruit, and they're still sweeteners. So they still do this, they, they still activate the sweet taste receptors, they still cause this hypoglycemia potentially, they may, stevia is not absorbed, they may cause microbiome disruptions like you mentioned. So, Plus, for me personally, I just don't think they taste that good. Mm. So why would I make cookies with monk fruit if it's not going to taste good? <laughs> That's I'd, much ra I'd much rather make a tray of cookies or brownies or a cake and just use less sugar and make something that I will enjoy the taste of. So I think we've kind of gotten a little too obsessed with taking sugar out completely and replacing it with these other compounds and we don't really know what they do and they don't really taste very good. I'd much rather make something that tastes good. Uh, you can cut the sugar down by 30, 40% and still have a great product. In fact, I would argue that cutting the sugar down will make it taste better. Mm. Why is that? That's because if there's too much sugar, it basically, be, because this sweet taste is so powerful, it overwhelms all the other tastes. So like I'll, have you ever had a, a blueberry muffin that actually tastes of blueberries? No, you, you, you got me. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, you know, what's happening there is the blueberry muffin has got so much other sweetener in there that you're overwhelmed the taste of the blueberries. So in Sugar Proof, we have a blueberry muffin with no added sugars. And, and it tastes of blueberries. And so I think, I think what we need to think about more is using less sugar and trying to enhance the flavors of the food so that we can enjoy it without being overwhelmed by the sweetness. So this ties into a great next point, which are what are some of the techniques to sh start sugar proofing or at least reducing the sugar dramatically. I heard a few, uh, you, know, you mentioned there, maybe using, you know, more blueberries or banana, you know, in, in, in some of those products, using some of the sweetness of, of, of natural foods in there. What are some of the other things you talk about in your book that, uh, that people can, can, can start doing to help limit the use of sugar for their children? Yeah, I mean, those would be one. We talk about finding all the hidden sugars. There's so many sources of hidden sugars in your pantry. You know, go take a look right now at your peanut butters, your pasta sauces, your salad dressings, things like that. Doesn't need to have added sugar in there. There's plenty of great peanut butters, pasta sauces, even ketchups that have zero added sugars. And there you can save a lot of sugar. You can mm -hmm. eliminate a lot of those hidden sugars. They're just put there to basically mask the taste of other chemicals and 
get you more hooked on those products. So there's hidden sugars. Breakfast for kids is super important. And there's lots, you know, for many families, breakfast has become a bit of a sugar fest. And there's ways to enjoy traditional breakfast items like pancakes or French toast. You know, pancakes don't have to be smothered in syrup. You can um, adjust the batter, for example, put more fiber in the batter mm -hmm. of the pancakes, put more protein in there, use a higher protein flour or add a bit of protein powder or an extra egg white, just kind of upping the fiber and upping the protein to kind of offset your sugar. And then what you put on top of your toast in the morning or your pancakes doesn't have to be sweet. You don't have to put jam on your toast. There's no, there's no rule about that. There's lots of other great alternatives that you can put on toast or pancakes or French toast in the morning and still enjoy them. So lots of little swaps like that. Same for snacks. Like I mentioned, 70 to 80% of snack products have added sugar. So look for ones with less or try to make your own with our sugar-proof recipes. And then there's the seven-day challenge. You know, ultimately, again, we're not trying to get people to give up sugar altogether. But this innate preference for sweetness can be dampened and you can dampen down your craving just by going without sugar for a while to kind of dampen down that craving for sweetness. That's amazing. You mentioned the seven day challenge. Are there actual noticeable physiologic effects, even cutting down sugar for seven days? Yes. Yeah. And we came up with the seven days based on that, those studies. So Physiologically, under the skin, there's studies to show, for example, improvements in blood pressure, improve, improvements in liver fat, blood lipids, and so on, after seven days of no added sh sugar. And then we've done this with hundreds of families now, and parents report noticeable changes in the outlook of their kids, their mood, their disposition, they're more stable, less likely to have a breakdown or a tantrum. And even noticing the taste of, of foods more noticeably after eliminating sugar. And again, this is because if you're on a high sugar diet, your sweet taste receptors are constantly being activated, overwhelming all the other tastes that might be in the food. So if you, if you take that out of the equation, you can awaken some of the other taste receptors. That's a you know great point there. Uh, you know, just just a short period of time will will have you know uh, huge benefits physiologically. Now, one of the things uh, that's been you know pretty exciting in you know my community in, in adults is intermittent fasting. And I know you mentioned breakfast for kids. Do you feel like intermittent fasting should be a strategy used in childhood at all? Or do you feel like because the child is growing that, that maybe it's not something they should partake in? I think for most healthy weight kids who are growing healthily, I think that is not recommended and breakfast is important. I'm a big fan. I personally fast three to five days a week, depending on my schedule. I do a 16 hour fast on most days of the week, which also has become easier for me to do since working at home. So I, so I would definitely recommend it for certain situations. We're doing studies at Children's Hospital now mm. in kids who are overweight or kids who have prediabetes or fatty liver under certain conditions. We're doing studies to examine the potential benefits. I will say that teenagers naturally, and I have two of them, and it's true in, in our house, Teenagers naturally tend to eat less breakfast, mm -hmm. uh, which shifts their natural eating pattern, which is something we're taking advantage of in those studies uh, that we're doing at the Children's Hospital, where we're asking for a six-hour eating window between about 12 and six so that kids can enjoy you know, the social aspects of eating uh, with their kids, with their friends at school, and with their family in the evening meal. So I think if it's done right under certain clinical conditions, there may be a place for it, but I think we're still at the very early stages. We're doing the research right now on some of that. 
You know, I didn't get to this a little bit earlier, and we certainly mention it a lot. We talk about, you know, fatty liver or, or the, you know, in the medical term, non, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And yeah. you hear the term fatty liver. Some people might think, okay, you get a fatty liver from eating a lot of fat, but that's actually not true. You get a fatty right. liver eating a lot of sugar. Uh, and as I believe uh, fructose is, you know, has a higher proclivity than r- regular sugar itself. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's the, certainly the evidence suggests that. And, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you talked about fatty liver disease, the assumption would be alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yeah. That would be the most common cause of fatty liver disease. And that's because alcohol is taken up by the liver and converted to fat and then stored. Some of it gets stuck in the liver and then it builds up in the liver. And then it, if it builds up too much, it will affect the liver's ability to function. And of course, the liver is a, a vital organ. It filters everything coming into the body. Everything that's absorbed in the gut first goes through the liver. And the liver then decides, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to extract this because I don't want it to go to the rest of the body, like alcohol or drugs, toxins. The liver filters those out. Uh, that same filtration process filters out ni- over 90% of fructose that comes in. And that fructose gets converted in the liver to fat. So that's the most common cause of fatty liver disease now is non-alcoholic, which really is code for fructose. So it's fructose fatty liver disease. Yeah. And it's so prevalent now because as a radiologist, I actually read a lot of liver scans and it's just, you know, very impressive how early and how much fatty liver disease you know, we're seeing now. And, and certainly fatty liver disease is associated with a lot of metabolic conditions as well, you know, um, associated with insulin resistance, high blood pressure, and associated with actually a lot of other chronic conditions that are out there. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. And what's difficult about it too is it's, I bet you that some of those observations are incidental observations where you weren't even necessarily looking for because right. there's typically no outward sign of a fatty liver. You can be a pretty healthy weight and still have fatty liver. So the only way to truly determine it is by um, MRI typically. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and when you do that in kids who are overweight, you see a large percentage of kids who are overweight with a fatty liver. That's amazing. I mean, thank you so much for your time today. You know, we went over really the the epidemic, which is childhood obesity and the culprit, you know, certainly a lot of additional culprits. But one of the things we know now, sugar being such a huge culprit, being sneakily put into our foods by, you know, food companies trying to trick us and trying to market to our kids. And thank you for bringing light to, to, to all of that that's going on. You know, I love your message and the ability to to, you know, if not cut it out completely, really great techniques in, in terms of being able to reduce the amount of sugar intake by our kids. Everybody, the book is called Sugar Proof. And before I get to my very last question, where can people find the book and where can people find out more about your work online? Yeah. So here's the book. It's available anywhere books are sold in regular hardback uh, Kindle or audio. You can look, you can follow us on Instagram at Sugarproof Kids or on Facebook. And then our website is sugarproofkids.com where you can learn more about what we're doing. And we were posting new recipes and new ideas all the time for sugar reduction in kids. So, uh, yeah, check us out. Definitely check it out. Grab a copy of the book. And my last question, as uh, as always, is of everything that you've experienced in life thus far, what has been your best medicine? <laughs> That's the best medicine. That's a tough question. I'm reflecting on that right now because I'm turning sixty next week. So mm. I've been I've been reflecting this week on what I've been doing differently in my fifties because I feel just as healthy, if not healthier at 60 than I did at 50. So, but it's, I, I would really, I've had a hard time, I would have a hard time pinpointing one thing, uh, but for me personally, sleep is important. Yeah. 
I don't drink alcohol because I don't like the way it makes me feel. Yeah. I used to, but I stopped about maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I don't drink coffee. I just don't like the taste. So I'm, I'm lucky there. I do drink a lot of green tea. I'm a mm. big green tea fan and I'm drinking several cups of that a day. I just don't drink sugary beverages and I just like good food. We eat a lot of veggies and fruits. Um, I don't follow any kind of strict diet per se, other than to say red meat rarely, but typically I'm eating a lot of uh, plant-based diet. Not Again, not, not strictly. It's just I like a lot of vegetables and fruits during my meal. So I don't know. I, I don't know if I can pinpoint one of those things, but those are those are some of some of my uh, some some of the things that I do personally that work for me. Well, sounds great. Thank you for the work that you do, Dr. Garan. I look forward to you know sharing this message with the people out there, ladies and gentlemen. Pick up a copy of Sugar Proof today, Dr. Goran, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for all you're doing. What a pleasure. It's fun to talk with you today. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Thrive State podcast. And if this podcast is bringing a lot of value to you, if you find that your life is just improving with this podcast, that your life is getting to the next level, please consider supporting it. And here's a few ways you can do so. You can do so by liking this video and commenting on this video and also sharing this video with your friends and family. Another thing you can do is go to rate this podcast dot com slash thrive state go ahead and leave us a five-star review there it will really really help this show grow and it, this will give me more time so that i could actually give more content to you just like you got in this episode and if you haven't already picked up a copy of my book thrive state your blueprint for optimal health longevity and peak performance you can pick it up now it became a number one new release in longevity Go to thrivestatebook.com. And if you enjoy the book, please consider leaving us a review as well. And the last thing you can do if you're liking everything here and you want to work uh, more closely with me as well as my team to get you into the Thrive State, go to kianvu.com slash accelerator and consider joining the home course, the Thrive State Accelerator. It's really the course that I use. It's the concepts that I use personally when I work with CEOs, celebrities, and my high profile clients to get them to the Thrive State. Again, the Thrive State Accelerator at kienvu.com slash accelerator. And because you're a listener of this podcast, I want you to save 25% by using the coupon code podcast25. I hope we continue to give value to you. And remember always, you are your best medicine. <laughs>